Welcome back to another episode of What's On Your Mind. Uh, I'm fortunate enough today to be joined by our UK squadron of ITPM. That's Ed Sheck and Jason McDonald here. Gents, always a pleasure to have you both on. Um, earlier this week, I was kind of looking at, at, at in-season and markets in general, just to kind of frame where we're at. Um, and we're, we are kind of 20% or so in terms of equities and in terms of the S&P anyway, above pre-COVID highs. And I know we're through earnings season now, and it just feels like things are a little bit getting a little bit choppier. I know volatility's come back into play a little bit, and there just seems to be more rotation going on now, and things seem a little bit less certain. Um, so I think it'd be great to hear your ideas, as always, this week, and kind of the context of how they fit into your portfolios, given that backdrop as well. Um, but anyway, far too much from me already. Uh, let's get into it. Ed, uh, why don't you kick things off today? Thank you, Chris. Hello, Jason. Uh, my first idea is Cornet Digital, K-R-N-T. It's in the industrial machinery sector and it's 3D printing, very much tied to the US apparel, garment uh, and textile industries. So Cornet has proprietary equipment. It develops, manufactures and markets digital printing technologies for apparel, garments and textiles. But before we get into the specifics of Cornet, just need to understand what's happening at a sector level. So the fashion industry is accelerating towards a shift to proximity manufacturing and on-demand manufacturing. So COVID, oh, yes, it's accelerated online demand. So by the end of 2023, two out of every three pieces of apparel will be uh, ordered online. That obviously matches the consumer habits uh, in online demand. One of the biggest problems for uh, brands and manufacturers is managing inventory levels. So if you're a big manufacturer, you print run 20, 30, 50,000, you may make them in Southeast Asia, you gotta print them all, make them all, get them back home, distribute them, and hope you sell. If you don't sell them, then you've got an inventory issue. Then you're slashing, discounting, moving it on, your margins collapse. Obviously, COVID oh, has also highlighted all the supply chain issues. So everyone wants proximity manufacturing. So 3D printing potentially allows big manufacturers to be able to produce at home. They can manage their whole operations a lot more efficiently. The third point is the fashion industry is quite under the pump from an environmental issue. Unfortunately, we have a bit of a throwaway culture, certainly in the fast fashion part of the market. You buy things cheap, you wear it a few times, you chuck it, you replace. 3D printing uh, uses more or less water per unit for a T-shirt print than conventional manufacturing. It has more environmental colorings. We'll come on to that later. And of course, if you're manufacturing near your end user, i.e. onshoring from a US perspective, you're obviously reducing transportation costs. 3D printing is going to change the whole manufacturing process. And as these systems get more uh, efficient, on, online, on-demand manufacturing and proximity manufacturing is going to change a lot of the manufacturing industry. So that's the sector tailwind. That enough is not enough reason to buy Cornet. It's $4.2 billion market cap. Sales $290 million, so it trades on 15 times. It's a premium stock. I'm going to try and explain why I think it will stay that, stay that way. So Cornet, as I said, it makes the kit, it sells you the ink, it sells you the software, it services the software, allowing on-demand manufacturing at home. It's cutting-edge proprietary technology. It's manufactured in-house, fully integrated, and they're the leader in direct-to-garment manufacture. DTG, okay? They've got 1,300 clients and they've got some of the big boys, okay? So Amazon, Walmart, these make up the top 10, which I'm going to come into more detail in a moment. Let's have a look at the quants. Didn't have a particularly good COVID, sales only up 7% last year, up 50% this year and a further 25% next year. Earnings, on the other hand, if you strip out the COVID year and compare 2019 to 2021, earnings per share is up 78%, but next year it's growing 62%. You know we like this sort of operational leverage. 
we want earnings to be going up faster than revenue and next year earnings will be going up two and a half times faster than revenue. On the quants, the last thing we have to look at is valuation. Trades on 15 times, it's premium. It falls to 11 and a half times, it's still premium. Okay, price to earnings, less important, 100 falling to 60. Okay, but the earnings delivery is really starting to come through. When I have a look at last earnings report, they beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. They're scaling the business successfully, seeing margin expansion, I'll explain why, that's driving the uh, EPS leverage. They're building brand recognition. They're at all the big fashion weeks, all the, you know, they have their own runways. They're very much brand recognized at the high end of the fashion industry, which is also positive. And they've got an increasing backlog of orders. So all this does is explain why the stock's where we're at. We know it's in a good sector. We know the stock's performing well. Why do we buy it now? Why is it going to go up 30% into next earnings? What I like about this business is its top 10 clients, which include Walmart, Amazon, uh, Levi's Gap, Next, those sort of brands, their top 10 are now driving 62% of total revenue, up from 49. Now, I think this is only a positive thing. I don't think this is a concentration risk, you know, what happens if Amazon pulls out. They're driving and embedding with the biggest manufacturers there are. Their clients are now getting a competitive advantage. I suspect that their competitors are going to have to get on board with the, how this industry is shifting. So last year, their deal with Amazon was worth about $150 million. In September of last year, it got upgraded to 400. So my primary, my first catalyst, Amazon are obviously loving their partnership. They're buying more kit. They're using more ink. Cornet successfully upselling all their systems, their software upgrades. They're becoming a more and more driver of this business. I think the risk to the numbers is only upside. I don't think Amazon are going to say, yeah, we're actually scaling back a bit with Cornet. I think there are just new markets, new products. They're loving it. It's going to go up. That's the first thing. Second thing, Cornet, they're not saying we've got the best kit. The big boys are loving it. This is the price. Take it or leave it. They are driving down another key performance indicator, the TCO, total cost of ownership. Because, of course, not all the world is producing goods on runs of 20 or 50,000. There's clearly a huge number of more exclusive brands, smaller manufacturers who might want to do print runs of 500, 1,000. If you drive down the total cost of ownership, you are potentially opening up a huge new market of potential clients. Cornet understands that people love their kit. You get the kit in the door, they're just going to use it more. You're selling more high margin ink. You're selling more software, more software upgrades. You are driving up the recurring revenue. So recurring revenue is doubled from 6 to 12%. This is a very important part of my thesis because this is high margin. This is higher PE sort of revenue. It's going to grow and make the, the mix greater. It's not about having the best kit and selling it at the highest price. It's actually the opposite. You get it in there, they've got the number one market share in the DTG market. They're doing better and better with the big clients. They're opening up new clients. They're scaling and their high margin uh, recurrables, if you like, is driving the EPS momentum. The third catalyst is they expanded into Asia last, out of US, Europe. Asian revenues have doubled from 4 to 8%. Again, I think the upside in the numbers is it, it's only upside in the numbers. I don't see any reason why the Asia region is not going to adopt and love the product and the technology and the disruption any less than the US and the Europeans always have. So that's it. Strong sector, best stock in sector. We understand what's going on now in their last earnings. And there are three reasons why I think earnings estimates will only go up. Right. Chris mentioned about the chop, you know, the market's very choppy. We've had earnings, the catalyst, the numbers are there. Where are all the catalysts? Well, I mentioned this because the way I'm going to structure this trade is slightly defensive. I want next earnings August the 3rd, so I've bought the August 85 calls. I've sold, sold the June 95s. If the stock rallies, great. Under 95, I can collect the credit, resell July, hopefully end up in the August. But because the market's so choppy and if interest rate expectations spike, 
these highly valued stocks could easily come for a bit of profit taking. So I want to collect the credits on the way. That's why I've structured it this way. So I've got an August to June calendar spread. OK. Uh, the reason why I bought the position last week, secondly, is in the choppy market, patience gets quite well rewarded. OK, this stock was at 115 before the first taper tantrum, gave me a chance to get in at 85. I'm not saying that this stock's going straight up, but I also wanted to buy the position before Tuesday the 18th. I think you'll see this on Friday the 21st. But the point is, yesterday, Cornet did an investor roadshow, a fireside chat, whatever you want to call it, a CEO with all the big investors giving it the big one. I wanted to see yesterday the stock outperform, and I think it was up about 4.5% in the down market. So that's another little catalyst. We've had the investor roadshow, stocks trading well. We know the risk in the valuation, but we've got the drivers. That's it. Cornet. Awesome. Good stuff. It's nice to see uh, a company take advantage of kind of 3D printing, like a technology that's been uh, making riffs, as it were, for a while. But um, yeah, good to good to hear something like that happening. Uh, Jason, let's go over to you. What what ideas have you got today? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great idea, Shecky. Um, sounds like uh, fantastic research done there as well. Um, so mine's a uh, uh, completely different sector. Um, so uh, we were yawning along with about COVID. Um, pray we've got some more yawns to come because this is actually a reopening idea. Um, but there's a bit of opportunity here on the basis that, as the guys have mentioned, we've just been through Q1 uh, reporting or Q4 for some people, but mostly Q1. Um, and that's thrown up a few opportunities. And, you know, on that topic, I'd say that... Um, we're in a really good environment now for long short trading. Um, I think this is a stock pickers market. Um, so on to the specific idea. Uh, the long idea I have is Boyd Gaming, uh, tickers BYD, market cap uh, just shy of $7 billion. Share price is around 60 bucks. Um, I got into this last week, but the, the trade is still here to do. So what do they do? Um, they are a very simple company to understand, multi-jurisdictional gaming casino company, which means they own and operate entertainment properties across uh, many states. So they've got casinos, slot machines, table games. They've also got hotel rooms, of course, um, and food and drink outlets at these places. Um, how do they look at their own business? They divide it up into three segments. So we've got Las Vegas locals, uh, which is people in the area, uh, that was uh, in Q1 of this year, about 25% of revenues in that category. They have nine casinos. They've got what they call downtown Las Vegas, which is, uh, as the name suggests, uh, that's three large casinos. That's only about 3% of revenues. And then the largest segment is the Midwest and the South, which is 72% of uh, Q1 revenues. That's uh, including, they've got four land-based casinos, six uh, riverside, uh, sorry, riverboat casinos, and uh, four barge-based casinos. Um, so it sounds like a bit of fun there to be had. Um, and these, these casinos, uh, they're operating across nine states in the Midwest and the Southern US. So uh, on to the, the quantitative analysis, as always, where we start. So not surprisingly, last year was not the best year, but these guys actually managed to come out of it flat. They lost 15 cents per share, so basically flat. If you look at the competition, they actually had large losses across the board. These guys came out pretty much flat. Uh, this year, we're looking at EPS on consensus this year of $3.24, growing to $3.45 next year, which doesn't sound much, but I expect that number to come up. The big thing is obviously the reopening this year where you've got um, uh, as I said, enormous rebound and, and generating three dollars twenty-four. Um, the P ratios are actually not um, that meaningful in the sector at the moment because of um, the comparisons with last year. But you know, for the record, there are nineteen times P ratio for F one and eighteen times next year. Um, sector averages are all over the place uh, because you've got companies that made losses last year and are still making losses this year um i'd say it's around 25 times but it depends who you look at and how you want to sort of slice the cake so these guys 
are this year trading at um, a bit of a discount and um, next year things start to kind of even up. Um, they're obviously outperforming on the earnings front um, and we'll come to that in a moment because we've, you know, we've had commentary from the, the management team. Um, so as I said, this is a reopening idea. Um, the, you know, as, as we'd expect, the, the, the most recent earnings report basically demonstrated that people are coming back to the casinos. Um, now, initially, the, the stock actually traded up um, to above 75 bucks after the results. Um, and I think there was a bit, a little bit of travelling and arriving here in terms of, you know, the market expecting them to come out with a good result, uh, which they did. And then subsequently, um, people started to sell. So the stock actually came back to briefly below 60 and it stabilised around 60, which is where I've started getting involved. That is the opportunity, essentially. So those Q1 results, how were they? Fantastic, in a word. Uh, they beat both top and bottom line, which means they beat on earnings and revenues. Um, they are in expansion mode. They're you know making bolt-on acquisitions, so not large acquisitions, but they're they're, they're expanding existing and properties and, and buying extra properties um, and just basically growing the portfolio. So there's, there's a little bit of capex going on there. Um, they're also focusing in terms of strategy. Surprise, surprise! They're focusing on online betting. Um, one of their initiatives, as the legislation started to change a couple of years ago, um, on a state by state basis with respect to sports gambling, um, as a as a re reaction to that, these guys entered into a partnership with MGM Resorts, which probably a lot of people will have heard of. Um, and through that, um, these guys with MGM have got an online and mobile gaming platform, which includes sports betting. Uh, poker and casino gaming in the jurisdictions where they've got their physical uh, casino resorts. Um, they have online licenses as well. Another partnership which is driving the earnings is um, with a company called FanDuel. Um, with these people, they've opened sports books, so sports betting books. Um, they've also started to introduce market-leading apps uh, for mobiles in Pennsylvania where they've piloted um, the apps and also in New Jersey. So during Q2 of last year, they started to expand that partnership with FanDuel and they've now got that um, in Indiana as well as the other two states. Um, and they've continued to expand that partnership um, and they're now launching mobile sports betting products um, in Illinois and Iowa. And going forward, and this is part of the um, sort of catalyst side of things, they'll be um, opening online gambling um, prospects and apps in Ohio, Louisiana, Missouri, and Kansas. Um, in addition, FanDuel um, are going to be basically the sports wagering partner for the NFL for the upcoming season, which yeah. is pretty good for me. Um, so that partnership uh, will provide between FanDuel and Boyd. <laughs> Uh, the end game and post game highlights as part of their sportsbook app. I think that, that's a fairly good uh, catalyst for um, the company going forward too. Um, and you know that's obviously pretty good for their brand image. Um, and I think that that's going to uh, increasingly drive positive cash flows. Um, on that subject, they've actually been building their cash um, from end of last year to end of Q1 this year. So the cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet has gone up. Uh, by a couple of hundred million over that three-month period. So they've now got 731 million of cash on the balance sheet. Um, and their interest coverage ratio is now looking a lot more healthy, up close to two times um, compared to where it was last year, which is, you know, for the obvious reasons. Um, now, in terms of, uh, you know, we've always got to think of what the potential negatives might be. The obvious one, of course, being um, if we get any kind of extension of lockdowns or if we get kind of a reversal of the reopening clearly that would affect things um in addition you know the company has basically said that they're still facing capacity restrictions because you, you can't open 100 percent immediately um and of course you know casinos and hotel casinos is a competitive landscape but i think these guys are kind of leading the pack and we can see that you know from the last earnings report which was on april the 27th where as I mentioned, they beat on the both top and the bottom line. Um, so they beat on revenues by 13%. They beat on earnings by 
100 percent you know just to note um that's the fourth quarterly beat um in succession their operating margins are up significantly just below 40 percent um and as i say they're benefiting from these initiatives which they started last year and are powering through on this year to strengthen uh, their current operations and to grow through you know these strategic measures with people like the FanDuel and that partnership um, so you know we've already seen earnings for this year moving up in the last 30 days I think that's going to continue um, you know the, the the CEO president on the on the, the most recent earnings call had this to say this was an exceptional quarter for our company as we as we achieved the strongest EBITDA and margin performances in our history as economic conditions improve and COVID vaccinations continue to roll out, we're seeing increased visitation and growing spend per visit across every customer segment. And just you know, lastly on that on that report, um, the the guys at uh, uh, Stiefel had this to say: basically, um, good luck to those guys you have to follow in the wake of that report. So these guys are currently knocking the the ball out of the park. So catalysts. I've talked about briefly, I think we have further earnings upgrades to come from the street. Trade structure, pretty simple. We can actually um, get a three to one loss ratio on a vertical pull spread. So my target price for this, it's around 60 at the moment, is 80 to 85. You can get on the 60, 80 September call spread um, around $5.25. So paying around $6.50, $6.55 for the September 60 call. Uh, selling out September 80 call for around $1.30 means you're paying a net $5, just over $5.25. You've got a break even there at 65 and a quarter. Stock price is currently around 60. If it goes to 80, you've got your three to one win launch ratio and you're taking in the next earnings report as well. So that is BYD. Awesome. Very good. Another, another good long there. Um, I'm sure we've probably got some shorts to cover today so let's switch to that side of things and uh, yeah. go back to you ed right. yeah right this is nice and simple right jm smucker 15 billion dollar consumer staple you know foods and snacks okay it basically it does coffee snacks and pet food you know the brands for the humans it's dunking donuts pillsbury folgers Smuckers, snacks, and for the beasts, it's Meow Mix, Kibbles, and Ainsworth Pet Nutrition. Operates under four segments. So you've got your retail coffee, 28%. You've got the snacks, 22%. Pet food, 37%. Actually, the largest part of the smucker. And then you've got international food away from home, 13%. $15 billion market cap. Bit on the small side, but I'm too happy to sort it. I already have sorted it. Let's have a look at the quants. Well, look at this. I mean, we know it's a consumer staple, but revenue is flat basically from 29 to 2021, flat as a skate's penis and actually falling 6% next year. Earnings, we're expecting 1% earnings growth this year, 3% decline next year. So the quants are going nowhere. Okay. Now, often when you screen and you see these bad quants, you have a look at the stock chart and you see the stocks already priced in these bad numbers and the stock's pretty much at the low end of the range, makes it less attractive. I had a quick look at the chart. I see the stock's actually rallied $20 from the last earnings report. Let's have a look at those. Well, the headlines were, we've beaten revenue, we're upgrading revenue, we're raising our sales guidance. So for all intents and purposes, look like an upgrade. Operating income was up 41%, $117 million. However, when you dig in, the previous year, they took a $52 million hit and impairment, goodwill impairment charge. That's obviously backed out. So you've got to take that out of the number. They also made divestments. That was a pre-tax profit of $27 million. So the long and the short of it is this extra $117 million of revenue, 80 is non-recurrable. Strip that out. Net sales were up 5%. Net income was up 4%. Free cash flow down 10%. So this upgrade of sorts wasn't very impressive. Then you read the earnings report, and this upgrade in sales is to 2% from 1%, if you can call that an upgrade. But this is the best bit. The CEO actually said, the reason why the strength in our numbers was driven by the COVID stay at home. 
just more home consumption of snacks. He's basically saying these really good numbers, which weren't, was because everyone was staying at home eating junk food on the sofa. Well, if that's one of your biggest tailwinds, I suspect that tailwind's coming to an end. So that's the first problem. Secondly, within this upgrade, they're expecting sales to fall 10% into the next quarter. Now that should be priced into the market, but I think it's gonna be greater and I'll explain why. The other interesting thing about the earnings report was the pet food business was 37% of revenue. He didn't even mention it. Now, it's probably been one of the best years for pets and being in the pet business. We know what Wolf's doing, Fresh Pet, Chewy, they're all growing their top line bigger and bigger and bigger. This is flat. So even with everyone eating crap food on the sofa at home, and even with everyone buying the pets if you are going to buy a pet, that growth, which isn't coming through in this company, that tailwind's only going to get worse for them. So I don't think they're really good numbers. I don't think it's an upgrade. And I think all their key performance indicators are going bad. Other thing you will find from the numbers is they are spending more and more on marketing and expenses, growing 5% over the last six months. That's a big number. That's a big number for zero top line or bottom line growth. What's that saying? Your brands are going nowhere. Now, I'm not even making the claim that we're all going to get healthy. We're going to you know, stop eating processed sugary foods. Maybe, maybe not, but you could say that a year ago and you'll be able to say it in a year's time, okay? What I am saying is if they're having to spend more to support the brands they have and they've had all the COVID tailwinds and they can't move the needle, then it's bad news for this stock. Net price realisation, the key performance indicator, is going down in three of the four and the one where it's not going down is the smallest part of the business. So they're operationally in trouble. What's happened to all the things that they buy since their last earnings report? Because the last earnings report covered Christmas. What do they do? They buy fats and oils, sugars and sweeteners, right? Green coffee, corn, fruits, grains and fruits. We know the inflation in the commodities market. It's been faster and harder in the last quarter. So when they report on June the 3rd, I suspect it's going to be a profits warning. Now, going back to what I said about corner and market timing and being patient in a choppy market, this stock has rallied $20. I got a short this in the, in the 137s. I think it's a bit lower now. But the point is, this rally is the opportunity for the trade. Okay, So all we're saying is we think this rally, yes, consumer to, uh, staples have actually done surprisingly well. This stock's up 18% year on year. I think the sector's up 30. So it is underperforming for reasons. But what I'm saying now is I'm trading this not because it's going to underperform, but when it's going down. I think they're going to issue a profits warning and the stock might go down to 115. So in terms of structure, you can go big or go home to the July vertical. You can buy the July 135s, sell the, uh, sorry, June 135s, sell the June 115s. It'll cost you 350 for your long option. You'll get a credit of 25 cents. So your total debit is $3.25. You've got $20 strike gap. That's what they'll be worth at $1.15 or below. So you make whatever, you make $16.75 on a $3.25 net spend. That's a five to one. However, the other way, and slightly more conservative way to trade this, is to buy the July 135s and sell the June 125s. And the reason you might do this is it is a consumer staple. So if it doesn't come out with a big profits warning, stock might just trade down five bucks or something like this. It might not crater. OK, it'll allow you to pick up your June credit and then you've got time for further weakness as the fundamentals play out. You set up the vertical. Now, also remember, if you think about being long corner and short this uh, just on their own, the risk is you get a weak market and inflation ticks up. So then Cornet may go down in the short term and consumer staple may actually become a bit more defensive. So if you trade August to June in Cornet, July to June here, at least you're hedging out the, you know, the shorter term market move and then you'll collect two credits and then you're left with your long options at the end for the big payday. So don't be a smucker. You don't want to own this. It's amazing that they haven't grown their their pet food business, considering what's been happening to the competitors in the last year or so. Yeah, um, definitely. Bad time, for sure. Yeah. Um, Jason, back to you then. What have you got for us? Okay. 
I'm going to remember not to be a smucker. <laughs> uh, my short is uh, is actually in the healthcare sector. Um, so we've got a company called Cardinal Health, tickers C A H. Market cap's around sixteen billion dollars, um, and share price around just above fifty six bucks. So what do they do? Uh, they are a drug and medicine distributor across the U.S. Um, so basically providing drugs and services to pharmacies, healthcare providers, uh, some of the manufacturers. They have two reporting segments, pharmaceutical and medical. Um, the pharmaceutical segment is the second largest pharmaceutical distributor in the U.S. and the largest, I love this term, nuclear pharmacy. Um, so what are their products and services? Well, they include distribution, manufacturing, specialty services, and as I say, nuclear and pharmacy services. Um, so they supply, uh, I mean, this is where the nuclear stuff comes in. Um, they supply to oncology, rheumatology, urology, and other pharmaceutical products to doctor surgeries. They're in the business of human plasma products, um, which they supply to hospitals and uh, other healthcare providers. Um, and they do a bit of consulting um, to the pharmaceutical manufacturers um, and healthcare providers. So that's the pharmaceutical segment. The medical segment um, is basically manufacturing stuff like, um, you know, single-use surgical curtains, gowns, clothing, examination, surgical gloves. Uh, I love this as well. Fluid suction and collection systems, um, and uh, and offering sterile and non-sterile procedural kits. You get the picture. Where do they sell and distribute this stuff? Uh, mainly North America, Canada, uh, but also Europe, South America, and uh, the Asia Pacific region. So quantitatively, what are we looking at? We're looking at pretty low P ratio for this thing, nine times. Uh, 9.4 times F1, 9 times F2, uh, pretty anemic earnings growth, 10% this year, 4% next year. Um, compared to sector averages of P for this year, 12.5 times, that compares to 9.4 times for these guys. Uh, P, F2 for the sector is 11 times compared to 9 times for Cardinal. Uh, the sector's growing the same this year at 10% in terms of earnings and uh, almost four times um, the amount next year. So CAH is growing at 4% next year and uh, the sector's around 13, 14%. So what is the idea? Well, um, I'll talk a bit about the last earnings report, of course, but what we've seen with this company is they have pretty weak business trends. Their gross profit um, is falling. Uh, it fell 4% year on year. Um, in the first quarter, which means also that their gross margins are under pressure, their operating margins are under pressure. The pharmaceutical segment has dropped 4% this year, uh, year on year. Medical segment profits are falling by 2%. And I think this is going to continue for at least the next couple of quarters, which is you know, where we're looking to take advantage. Um, I think they might also, uh, I mean, this is probably the icing on the cake um, for the bear case, but they have a bit of customer concentration. Um, one of their biggest customers is CVS Caremark, which um, generates over 20% of their revenue. Um, if they lose that account, and this is quite a, a competitive area, then that's a hole for them. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying it would be icing on the cake. And of course, you can't predict if that does happen, when it's going to happen. Um, but they have high customer concentration. And their top five customers represent 40% of their revenues. Um, as I say, cut for competition um, in that area and in the med tech space. Um, so they've got basically competition in both of their business segments. Um, the, the pharmaceutical supply chain, um, they've got big guys they're competing against in the form of McKesson and Emeritus Bergen, as well as uh, the smaller guys. Um, and the medical device market is a mature one with growing competition as well, which is, is again compressing the medical segment's margins, at least in the short term. On to that last earnings report, which was on May the 6th. They had a, 
they had a weird financial year. So they had a weak fiscal Q3, it was for them. Um, they missed it on both earnings and revenues by 3% and 2% respectively. Uh, earnings actually fell as well year on year. So they didn't just disappoint on expectations, but they have falling earnings, as I've said. Um, falling earnings in both divisions. Um, part of that is related to um, weakness in generics volumes on the basis of uh, the COVID-19 stuff. But these guys have actually said that they project this to last into their next fiscal year, which is, um, you know, the, the rest of this calendar year. Um, they also, in that report, narrow but key, slightly lowered their, their fiscal 2021 outlook range, which is effectively um, a profits warning. Um, so what do I see? being the catalyst here for this short idea clearly i think earnings price targets recommendations are going to be under pressure from the street i think they're going to see downgrades in all three areas so i've got a pretty basic option structure on here um it's a 45 55 dollar put spread so i'm long the 55 dollar strike this is for september again again i want to take in the next earnings report so long the 55 strike for September, uh, short the 45 strike. That's going to cost me, um, or sorry, it already has cost me a net $2.50. Break even to around 52 and a half, uh, which is not that much lower than where we are here. If the stock does go to 45, uh, which is easily possible, we're on a three to one win loss ratio again. Um, so that's it. Pretty simple, really. I think the worst case scenario with this thing is it just doesn't do anything right yeah okay uh nice stuff good to good to hear from you both uh, today gents lots of well explained ideas i think there's uh, lots of things that you guys went through in the the concepts of your sort of idea generation there that people will be able to pick out and apply as well so really useful thanks for both of you coming on the show this week uh for all of you guys watching don't forget to head over to our website where we've got lots of uh more lots more educational content whether it's our courses our mentoring programs or our webinars and things like that uh, we've got a list of our upcoming events and webinars on the events page of the website there's always good things to take away from those as well practical things that you can implement uh, after you've watched them um, but that's it for this episode i hope you guys all enjoyed it and make sure you join us again in a couple of weeks time for another episode of what's on your mind